Well, again this morning, welcome to Advent. What is Advent, you might ask? Advent is the season before Christmas. What kind of season is Advent? Advent is a season of waiting. Where are we waiting? In a land of deep darkness. Over the last week, um, I've been praying uh, for my own soul and for our church that this, this Advent would be the greatest Advent ever. That's been, that's been my prayer. And I don't know exactly what that looks like. I'm not sure exactly how that happens. But I think it has to start with us knowing that we're waiting in a land of deep darkness. And the land of deep darkness is also a land of ashes. In the Bible, darkness and ashes go together. Isaiah and Job both use the language of darkness and ashes to talk about loneliness and a sense of despair. <clears throat> Isaiah tells us that a sign of humiliation, we see this in the Old Testament, a sign of humiliation is when one spreads ashes beneath them. Job, in his suffering, he, he sat in ashes. Job said that he had become like ashes, which meant that he, he was undone. He, he felt like he was over. He, he felt doomed and out of luck, and he, he felt like he was just stuck in a sense of dread. Because that's what darkness and ashes can do to you. you you can't see beyond where you are. Everything kind of closes in around you. What once was is no longer, but you still got the memory. What might have been did not come to be, but you still got the unfulfilled dreams. And th this shouldn't make you cynical. We should never be cynical. But there is a kind of heavy dose of realism that recognizes that this world is broken and that superficial solutions do not work. That's the world we live in. We live in this world. This is why John Bunyan calls this world the city of destruction. We, we live in the land of darkness, the land. We live in the land of darkness and ashes. And I gotta tell you that this morning because I know that on your radio, and in the places where you shop till you drop, I know the songs that you're listening to, right? We're listening to, it's the most wonderful time of the year. And we're listening to Holly Jolly rocking around the Christmas tree, right? All that. And look, I love that. I love it. Okay, we're going to get there. But we're not there yet. Because right now we're in a season of waiting, and we need to know that we're waiting in a land of darkness and ashes. And, and, and knowing that, knowing that we're waiting in the land of darkness and ashes, like that is vital to the real meaning of this whole thing. Okay, and so this morning what I want to do is I want to show you this in Hebrews chapter 2. I want to show you three truths that we find here that we need to remember this Advent. Three things, really simply. Number one, current reality. Current reality. Number two, obvious predicament. Number three, active hope. Current reality, obvious predicament, active hope. And so, Father, again, we pause now and we ask for you to do what only you can do through the preaching of your word. By the power of your spirit, we pray, speak to our hearts and accomplish your will. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, for current reality, look at verse 5. Everybody take a look at verse 5 there. The writer says, For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. There's a couple things I want to highlight here quickly. 
First is angels. He mentions angels because angels have been a big part of chapter one. Remember that the writer starts the book of Hebrews showing us the supremacy of Jesus. He gives us 10 glorious facts about Jesus in chapter one. And the last fact is that Jesus is superior to angels. And so from chapter one, verse four, all the way through the end of chapter one, what the writer is doing is, is he's backing up that claim that Jesus is superior to angels with seven different passages from the Old Testament. He uses the Old Testament to emphasize the point, to stress the point, to belabor the point that Jesus is greater than the angels. And so in chapter two, verse five, when he says, It was not to angels that God subjected the world to come. What's implied here is that God subjected the world to come to Jesus. Uh, But basically the writer is resuming his exposition from chapter one. He took a little break in chapter two, verses one to four, to give us a warning. He warned us not to neglect our great salvation, but now he's back to stressing the superiority of Jesus. And and what he says here in verse 5 is right in line with what he said in chapter 1, verse 13. So look back up to chapter 1, verse 13. It's another quote from the Old Testament. Chapter 1, verse 13. He says, And to which of the angels has he, God, and to which of the angels has God ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And the point here is to say that God didn't say this to the angels, but God said this to who? He didn't say it to the angels, not to angels, but to who? Jesus. That's what he's saying here. God the Father told Jesus, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And enemies being your footstool is another way to say that they're subjected to you, right? That makes sense. We get that. If, if they're your footstool, it means that you are over them. You're higher than them. They're subjected to you. And so in chapter 2, verse 5, the writer is repeating that same idea. He's using the same construction that he's been using in chapter 1. Not angels, but Jesus. Not angels, but Jesus. Jesus is greater than the angels, and the reason he's greater is because he sits at the top. He reigns over everything. What the writer's doing here, I think the, the, I think the writer is still showing us the supremacy of Jesus. Now, the second thing to notice in verse 5 is that phrase there, the world to come. Look at the end of verse 5, that, that last phrase in verse 5. Literally, the world to come is the world that is coming. It's the, he's talking about the future world. God did not subject the future world to angels. He subjected the future world to Jesus. And when it comes to this future world, look what the writer says. The very last thing in verse 5. He says, this future, this, this, the world to come, verse 5, the world to come of which we are speaking. I say, wait a second, what? Did y'all know that the writer in chapter one has been speaking about the future world? Did, did, did we pick that up in chapter one? What has the writer said in chapter one that sounds like the world to come? What is it? It's, it's the fact that Jesus reigns. Jesus has been raised from the dead and exalted. That's, that is the hallmark of the future world. It's that Jesus is the promised Davidic king and he is seated on his heavenly throne and the future world is subjected to him. So be, because the writer has been talking about the glory and reign of Jesus in chapter one, that's why he can say he's been talking about the world to come. Okay. Now on that point, The writer says in verse six, it has been testified somewhere. And then he quotes from Psalm eight. What is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? And there is a long and exhilarating debate here 
about exactly what the writer of Hebrews is doing with this quote. So what I want to do is take a little excursion for just a few minutes, and I want to talk about that, okay? And I just want to warn you, it's going to get a little bit complex for about five minutes. And so everybody just look at your neighbor, say, get ready, okay? All right, hang with me here. Now, we looked at this passage earlier this, I mean, it was probably like February, I think, of this year. And Pastor Kenny, I miss that dude. Miss that guy. He's in Florida right now where it's nice and warm and sunny. Miss him. But he, he, he preached a passage and he said that the question is on whether the writer of Hebrews is thinking about humans in general or, or is he thinking about the Messiah in particular. When he quotes Psalm 8, is he referring to mankind in general or is he talking about the Messiah in particular? And Kenny said the answer is yes. I think he's right. In other words, I think that both humanity in general and Jesus in particular are in view here. But I want to say that humanity is in the background and Jesus in particular is in the foreground. And this has to do with a biblical theological theme in Scripture that, that teaches us, that shows us that Jesus is the last Adam. The last Adam, okay? The true and better man. Let me explain this to you a little bit. This might be new for some of us, but, but in Scripture we, we see this theme arise. It's clear in Romans 5 and other places, but just, just like the first Adam, Adam and Eve, first man, Adam, just like he represented all humanity in old creation, Jesus is the last Adam who represents redeemed humanity in the new creation. So Adam and Jesus, old creation, all of humanity, new creation, redeemed humanity. And as our representative, it means that there are several things true of Adam that's true of us, like sin, fallenness. And so with Jesus, there are several things that are true of Jesus that are said of Jesus that are also true of us because he's our representative. One amazing place that we see this in Scripture is the book of Daniel, chapter 7. And anytime we talk about the book of Daniel, it's like we're getting deep, okay? Daniel is like the Old Testament book of Revelation. In Daniel, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, Daniel has a, a vision. And in you know, the vision he starts, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. So he's a, a vision he has. And this son of man comes, he comes through the ancient of days, and to him, to the son of man, is given dominion and glory and the kingdom. All supremacy is given to this son of man. But then a few verses later, Daniel says, that the saints of the Most High will have dominion and glory and a kingdom. And so the question is, which is it, Daniel? Who, who has dominion? Who has this kingdom? Is, is it the Messiah? Is it the Son of Man? Or is it the saints? And the answer is yes. Because the Son of Man the final Adam, he is representative of the saints. He is representative of those who will also with him inherit his dominion. Now this same theology shows up in the very last chapter of the Bible, in the book of Revelation. Now the book of Revelation is like the New Testament book of Daniel, okay? And it's all about the glory of Jesus. The book is all about the glory of Jesus. Listen to, to, to this. This is the last chapter, Revelation 22. Listen to what John says. Revelation 22, verse 3. No longer will there be anything accursed. This is heaven, right? But the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. 
They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign with him forever and ever. So the, the, the servants of the Lamb, the, the saints of the Most High, redeemed humanity, they will reign forever and ever. That, they, he's talking about us here. Did y'all know that? He's talking about redeemed humanity. The, the point is that Jesus, because Jesus reigns, as Jesus reigns, Jesus our representative, Jesus the last Adam, as he reigns, we reign with him. Make sense? We inherit his dominion. That's a biblical theological theme. And that's what's going on in Psalm 8. That's what's happening in Psalm 8, okay? There's the Son of Man and there's redeemed humanity. There's Christ and there's Christians. And I think both are in view. But I. I I I still see Jesus as being in the foreground. Jesus is the foreground just like he has been in chapter one. And the big reason that I think that is because I think the writer of Hebrews understands Psalm eight to be about the Messiah in its original context. So I think the writer of Hebrews, he reads Psalm eight and he reads it to be about the Messiah in the book of Psalms, which, which means what, why it matters is because I think the writer is applying Psalm 8 to Jesus right away here in verse 6. Okay? I think that's, that's why it matters. I think, he's, I think he's talking about Jesus in the foreground right away in verse 6. And I just want to tell you, I just need to be clear. I'm not 100% sure that's what he's doing, Okay? <laughs> I'm like 93% sure, all right? 93%. I I can preach it at 93%, all right? But I need you to work with me, okay? I think Jesus is in the foreground. Okay. Look look back at your neighbor. Say we made it. You made it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Verse 6 now. Verse 6. See those little quote marks in verse 6? That's where he's quoting Psalm 8. Little quote marks. He's now quoting the Old Testament, Psalm 8. Psalm 8 is addressed to God. And he says, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? You have made him a little lower, a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. And now from this point onward, the writer is just, he's just going to break this down for us. And the first thing he does is he highlights what he means by subjection. Just to be clear, he explains. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside of his control. Total control. That's what he's saying. The foreground here is that God the Father has given Jesus, the Son of Man, total control. Because that's what it means to be the risen and reigning king over the future world. Jesus himself said in Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus says that about himself. That's true. Right now, really and truly, actually in this moment, Jesus reigns. He reigns. We, uh, we repeat that every Sunday at our commission. Right, we believe that. That's the fact that Jesus reigns, that's, the, that's, the, that's why we exist as a church, okay? That's why we're here. And so, some of y'all know this story. I, 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 I tell this story every time we do the foyer, that years ago, early on, when we were having church planting conversations, and anytime I'd meet with someone and talk about church planting, I, I made it a commitment. I tried every time when we sat down to talk, the first thing I'd say is I'd say, hey, first off, Jesus reigns. He has all authority in heaven and on earth, which means he does not need us. Which is still true today, right? Just to check, we know that, right? 
Jesus doesn't need us. Jesus doesn't need our church. Hey, Jesus doesn't need that steeple. Okay. He, do, he doesn't. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need anything. Our church, our church with our mission to go deep as disciples and to send out droves of disciples, we have to remember that this is not a have to, it's a get to. This is a get to. We only get to be part of what Jesus is doing in the world because he chooses to work with us. He doesn't need us, he chooses in his grace to work with us. And so we just need to clarify that all ministry as a church and as individuals, all ministry is a get to when we understand that Jesus has all authority. When we understand that Jesus is the one who reigns. And he reigns right now because that's what it means to be king. Kings reign. That's what it means to be Lord. That's what it means to have all authority. Jesus has that authority right now. That's current, current reality is that Jesus reigns. That's number one. He reigns. Now here's the second thing to look at. It's the last sentence of verse eight. This is the obvious predicament. Last sentence in verse eight. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. There's a, there's a problem here. The writer's recognizing this. There is an obvious predicament when it comes to what we see. The writer has just told us that Jesus reigns over everything. God the Father has put the future world in subjection to him. Jesus has total control. But just wait, just look around for a minute, right? Like at present, if we open our eyes to what's going on in the world, in our communities, what's going on around the, the globe, it sure doesn't look like everything's in subjection to Jesus. There's a tension here, right? And this tension has existed for a very long time, all right, for like a couple thousand years. And I, 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 I love how the old poem by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow captures this. Anybody, who, who lives in the Longfellow neighborhood, Minneapolis? All right. All right, this is your guy right here, okay? Longfellow, okay? The, you know, this, this has been turned, this, the name of the poem is Christmas Bells. It's been turned into, a, it's been put to music, turned into a song. It's an awesome song, love the song. But Longfellow, he, I think this story is important. Longfellow wrote this poem in, six, in 1863, in the middle of the Civil War, which was a horrible time, horrible time. And he personally, his family suffered greatly during the Civil War. And so he wrote this poem at that time. And this is, this is what he says in the first lines. He says, I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Christmas. But then later he says, in despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And we know that tension, we feel, we feel that tension. There's this current reality that Jesus reigns, but there's this obvious predicament that a, a, a lot of people over whom Jesus reigns hate him. And, and they live right now in rebellion against him. One commentator on this passage in Hebrews, he says there are two underlying issues in this passage. Number one, if Jesus is the son, as expounded in chapter one, why is his rule not complete and obvious to all? That's number one. Number two, how does Jesus's humiliation 
as the man who suffers and dies, not make him inferior to angels. Both of these questions, I think the issue here in this passage has to do with glory and suffering. Glory and suffering. If Jesus reigns, why is there still suffering and evil in this world? And if Jesus is the one who reigns, why did he experience suffering and evil himself if he's this great king? Here's the question that we have to feel. The question is, if Jesus truly reigns right now, why, why are we still dealing with darkness and ashes? Right? You get that? If he reigns, why, why darkness and ashes? I think this has to be, has to be one of the, one of the most important questions for Christians to figure out. I don't, we, have to, we have to figure this out. And I think the key here is understanding that right now we are living in between two overlapping worlds. Remember Adam, old creation, Jesus, new creation, old world, future world, the world that is to come, right? Although right now we're living in this present world, old world, old creation, the future world through the life, death, resurrection, and exaltation of Jesus, the future world, the new creation has been inaugurated here. It's, what's happened is that Jesus, through his life, death, resurrection, and exaltation, Jesus has initiated or he has introduced the world that is to come into this old world. You can't really understand the New Testament or the Christian life without that. That's so important, right? What's happened here? The, now the theological term for this is inaugurated eschatology. Okay. Whoa. All right. You guys like The Office, right? The show The Office. You guys know what I'm talking about? Somebody raise your hand for me. The Office, the greatest show ever, okay? <laughs> so good. My goodness. It's funny. Never, never going to be another like it. So in this one episode, <laughs> you're going to remember this if, you, if you're a fan. Season eight, Dwight, he throws this garden party, okay? <laughs> and he, this is... Season eight, episode four. You're going to look it up later. Um, and he's, he's preparing for this garden party. And, man, he, he really wants to, to impress his boss. And, and so he works really hard at, at trying to understand garden party etiquette. And he, he just really wants this to be a proper party. Okay, so he's got everything set up. He's, he's hosting this party at Shroot Farms. And what he does is he stands at the entrance of the party and he's dressed in a tuxedo and he's got this like top hat on. And what he's doing is every time someone comes to the party, he announces their names really loudly. And the reason that he, he does this is that he had read in this book on garden party etiquette, he had read that announcing your guest is a way to honor them. And the louder and more formal that you announce them, the more honor you bestow on them, okay? So that's what Dwight's thinking, which means when, uh, when Jim and Pam come, the best characters in the show, Jim and Pam, they got their daughter, Cece. When they come, this is actually a sweet moment. When they come, Dwight, he's at the edge of the thing. When they, they can walk in up, he says, James, Pamela, and... P.P. Halpert. And the joke is that he gets her name wrong. That's the funny part. The, the joke is that he announces their daughter's name. He, he, he gets, it, gets it wrong. But it's a sweet scene, and he's trying to show honor on them. And, uh, okay, how is that connected to the resurrection of Jesus? Hang with me. <laughs> I'm about to show you. All right, listen to this. All right, look. Here's the deal. When Jesus was raised from the dead... It was like God the Father 
was announcing, shouting his name. The resurrection of Jesus is when God the Father formally introduced Jesus to this present world. And what he said was, he says, hey, here is the Son of God. Romans 1, he was declared to be the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. He was declared, this here, hear him, he is the Son of God. Here is the Lord of all. Here is the King of kings who reigns over everything. That's what the resurrection is saying. That's what God the Father is saying of Jesus, announcing him in his resurrection. But here's the deal. This is the thing. Rather than Jesus stay here in this present world, Rather than Jesus reign, per, physically present in this, in this present world, Jesus ascended to his heavenly throne where he reigns now over the future world that is coming. So here's the way to think about it. This present world is not the same because the future world has been introduced. And the future world is not fully here because it's only been introduced. Which means we right now, we are living, as Christians, we are living in between two worlds. Jesus reigns over the future world that is coming. But right now in this world, his future world reign is manifest spiritually. It's not obvious to everyone. Remember in the Gospels when Jesus tells all the parables of the kingdom of God? Remember how Jesus explains the kingdom of God? There's a hiddenness to it. The kingdom of God is like a grain of mustard seed, right? There's a hiddenness to it. It's small for now, but it won't always be that way. For now, the reign of Jesus means that he sends his spirit, his invisible spirit, and he sends his good news of his reign. And right now, all around the world, the good news of the reign of Jesus is being announced, and people are believing that news, like us. We've heard the announcement of his reign. We've believed the announcement of his reign. We as Christians, as believers, we are a people who have been changed by Jesus spiritually. We're not perfect yet, right? We're not perfect yet. He's still working on us. These bodies are mortal. They must put on immortality. We're mortal right now. But we have been born again spiritually. We have been changed spiritually to become part of that future world. Even as the full consummation of that future world is yet to come as we wait, wait, as we still wait for Jesus' return. We are waiting still for Jesus' final physical entrance. We're waiting for his second coming we're waiting for his last advent, right? His last advent, which I think is pretty important for us to remember during advent, right? We're still waiting. And this waiting that we're doing, this waiting is in a land of darkness and ashes. And that's obvious to us, that's obvious. Current reality, Jesus reigns. Obvious predicament, we're still waiting for the consummation of his reign. And number three, act of hope. Verse nine, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. The writer's affirming here, what he's been saying this whole time. He's affirming that Jesus reigns. Jesus is the son of man who has been crowned with glory and honor, just like Psalm 8 says. Although we see a land of darkness and ashes, we know what is true about Jesus. We know that by his resurrection, God has crowned him. God has enthroned him 
as king over all. That's not new information to what the writer has been saying in chapter one. But what is new information here is the application from Psalm eight, verse seven, that Jesus is him who for a little while was made lower than the angels. And then the line that because of the suffering of death, Jesus was crowned with glory and honor. This means that, that now, the, what the writer's doing, the writer's not just stating the fact that Jesus reigns, but he's telling us how Jesus came to reign. That's what he's doing here. It, he's telling us that Jesus' reign came through suffering. It's that Jesus reigns right now as him who for a little while was made lower than the angels. That's referring to Jesus' first advent, his first coming. It means that Jesus, who is superior to angels for a little while, for a time within redemptive history, Jesus humbled himself and he stepped into this present world to be lower than angels. Mild he lays his glory by. Jesus became a human like us here in this world and he subjected himself to human suffering. Jesus experienced the darkness and ashes of this land. We love stories, right? Y'all know we love a good story as humans and we love, we especially love a good underdog story, right? Those are our favorites. The, the rags to riches plot, that storyline, that is one of the most ancient storylines there are in all of literature. And uh, it can at least be traced back to an old Norwegian fairy tale called Askeladden, Askeladden. And you've, you've heard this story before, right? You guys know this story, right? It's about a son who's the runt of his family and uh, he's always overlooked. He's the small guy, the insignificant one. He's overlooked and he always gets the, the worst chores in the house. But then later, Against all odds, he becomes this glorious hero king. You guys know this story, right? Ascaladen? His name, Ascaladen, it actually means Ash Boy. Ash Boy. Ash Lad. I don't know Norwegian. I just read that, okay? Just clarify. Um, he, his name is Ash Boy because he was given the job. Of, of working in the kitchen, which is the very bottom of the castle where there's no windows, so it's dark. And he had a dirty job. His job was to scrub the pots and pans and he had to clean the ashes of the hearth. Ash boy. It was, it was dirty, dirty, lowly work. We know this story, right? It's the story of Cinder Ella, right? Cinder as in fire cinder, as in ashes. This is, this is Cinderella. And if you can remember in the story of Cinderella, her job was down in the kitchen where it was dark, there are no windows, and she scrubbed pots and pans and she swept the ashes and she had dirty, lowly work. That, that's the setting of that great fairy tale that we love. The setting is darkness and ashes. And of course, we know what comes in that story. There's a transformation, or dare I say, an ascension in the story of Cinderella, where she's glorified and she, they, her and the, they live happily ever after, right? We know what happens. It's a, it's a great story. Now, the reason that we love that story, the reason we love stories like that is because it echoes a truer and better story. When Jesus for a little while was made lower than the angels, he came here to experience 
darkness and ashes in its fullest extent. He took, Jesus took the lowest of lowly jobs. He suffered to the point of death, even death on a cross. And it wasn't an accident. His suffering and his death did not, didn't, didn't throw a wrench into God's plans, but it was actually, here's the thing, it was, it was actually through his suffering. It was actually because of his suffering that God has highly exalted him. God has raised him and enthroned him as the reigning king. He is not dead, nor doth he sleep. God raised him to be one who reigns and who also understands darkness and ashes. <laughs> the one who reigns gets the darkness and ashes because he's been here. He's been here. And see, that's our active hope. That's our active hope. It means that we, we're waiting in a land of darkness and ashes. But we don't have to fret over the darkness and ashes. We, we, don't, we may not like it. It's okay not to like it. We don't like the darkness and ashes. But we don't need to fret over the darkness and ashes because we know, we know that darkness and ashes is not the end of the story. Jesus is reigning over the world to come. And now we wait for the consummation of that world. We wait for the consummation of that world, that future world come here when we, as his brothers and sisters, as Jesus' brothers and sisters, we ourselves, we, Ash Boys and Cinderella's, we ourselves, will reign with him. There's gonna be more on that next week, all right? For now, we come to this table. And we come to this table today with a very simple prayer. It's a prayer we find in scripture in the book of Revelation. It's the simple prayer, come Lord Jesus, Do you know what would make the greatest advent ever? Is if Jesus returns, right? And we should pray for that. We should pray that Jesus would return. We should pray for it and we should hope for it even as we come to this table this morning. The, the table here, the bread represents the body of Jesus. The cup represents the blood of Jesus. And when we eat the bread and when we drink the cup, we are proclaiming Jesus until he comes. At this table, we are actively hoping in Jesus. And if you do that this morning, this morning if you're here and you trust in Jesus Christ, we invite you to eat and to drink with us and to hope in him. We're going to serve the bread first. Just hold it. I'll come back up. We'll eat it all together. Uh, the body of Jesus is the true bread. Let us serve you.